Can you see me? Can you see my page? I am on because we are live now on Facebook. Um, I don't know where I'm supposed to find the live. Okay, if you go to my page, uh -huh. my Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah, you should see it there. Um. Oh, yes, now I can see. And it. then you can share it. Um. Okay. Okay. As we're waiting for people to join, I just want to say hello to Ishara Gavinder. A warm welcome from Durban, Anusha Chetty. It's lovely to have you guys here. Yeah, we're just, are you able to, um, are you able to, yeah? Am I able to share? Share it on your page? I have, I have shared it. Great. Um, yeah. Great. And, uh, Yeah, so it's on my page now as well. Should be. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. So very warm welcome. It's beautiful, beautiful day in Johannesburg. And we just want to say warm welcome from Dr. Dudu and myself, who I'm going to introduce in a moment. Uh, we're very excited to have, uh, have you join us on Seeds of Hope, um, another episode in the month of August in Women's Month, celebrating women. And uh, this is Nishani Ford, and I'm bringing you some of the most dynamic women in my life. Um, I just want to say a warm welcome from my, um, my co-hosts and my team behind the scenes, which is Richard Maestri and Patrick Stevens. A very warm welcome to you all. Um, I want to share with you quickly before I introduce my guests, how uh, Succeed started and, and to get us going. And while, while everybody starts settling in and coming on live, let me share with you quickly. Um, it was my 30 year reunion, uh, high school reunion. And uh, so the, the sports boy, Richard, uh, Richard Bastry and myself, I was the cheerleader, Dudu. Uh, <laughs> I was cheerleader. Uh, we hooked up and we co-led a project in our little town, uh, Tongat, uh, on the north coast of KZN, um, where we, uh, we helped. It was actually a class project and we assisted um, a, a home, a children's home with a Christmas uh, party. We co-led that and many conversations later and God, of course, planting the seed um, about, you know, that he provides seed for the sower. And that is how Succeed was born. It was born out of many conversations, many confirmations. Um, on the 12th of the 12th, uh, you know, Richard said something and I said, oh my word, that's, that's strange because it's something that God planted in my heart since I was 14 years old. And so wow. it, it began, it began and it began in, in such a um, accelerated manner and in such a, it's such a beautiful way. God brought it together. And, and I like to call it a God incidence, not a coincidence. And so with that came uh, a dream of what we would do. We started with the agriculture and it is really a dream to see every home in South Africa having some form of um, self-sustaining garden, whether it's a container or if you're in a flat or whether it's a little patch in your garden, but really we want to see this and we want to teach it and we want to, we want people to become self-sufficient. The other thing that we started to develop uh, was um, uh, socioeconomic development, which is really um, entrepreneurial and a business skills, financial literacy kind of program. And then came coding because we wanted to bring it to every young child in this country. Um, 
And so we want to take this to the communities, take this everywhere and make it completely accessible because we believe that a seed is planted in every, every person's heart and God waters that seed, you know? So, and then of course, last but not least, it's Rubel and which is the reusable sanitary towels, um, which is a, pro, uh, a project for the month of August uh, being Women's Month. I especially wanna welcome now uh, Dr. Dudu Glovo, uh, a dear, dear friend of mine, a sister in Christ. She's, when I asked her for her bio, she said, she's God's child. <laughs> she's a wife, a mother, and an academic, and uh, a very, very dear friend as well. So welcome, Dr. Dudu. It's wonderful to have you on Seeds of Hope. Thank you, thank you so much, Nishani. Um, I, I am absolutely honored to be talking to you today and to be talking to everyone who's going to watch this, um, who's watching right now and who's going to watch later. It's an absolute privilege to be talking to you. Um, for me, you are this dynamite of a woman. And so I'm, I'm, I am totally not surprised um, by what you're doing with Succeed, because when I think of Nishani, I think of a woman who's on her feet and is doing something and is always pursuing purpose, you know, and is doing something not just for herself, but is always mothering the nation. So Thank yeah, you. I'm absolutely blessed to be here. Thank you. You know, you, you gave me that beautiful prophetic word. Remember the word Deborah? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, so let's start. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, so, you, uh, uh -huh. I, I met you. I met you in church, and you were busy with your your PhD and uh, just so many things on the go at the same time. I mean, you're a woman who's who graduated with your MA, breastfed two babies, um, and earned a PhD in nine years. Like. Wow, talk about a dynamite. Um, yeah, I, the, I think there are seasons in life and we, we get to be in different seasons and in each season we have to seize the moment yes. um, and we have to be where we, and we have to be in that season fully. You know, we have to be present. I read something recently where um, it was talking about this, the past, forget about it, and the future is in the future. What you have is right now, and yes. so start dancing. And I think for me, those nine years, um, re and this is also at the end of the nine years, right? Yes. When the nine years were happening, I was just, I just put my head down and had the deep conviction that this is where God wants me to be. And so I just went from day one to day two, day three, with that, that deep conviction guiding me, being the North Star, as it were. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, in nine years, I, I got married. I had, I graduated with an MA, then I had my first child. And three months after having my first child, I was, yeah, I was lost. I think I am only starting to realize now that many, women have that same sense after having yes. a child because yes. like motherhood is this amazing thing when you are thinking about it and then you are hit reality. Like, yeah reality of you have this amazing human being that you that you have to look after and you totally love them but somehow for me anyway I was lost I was feeling like I have lost some a part of me and so when you was three months old the only thing I knew how was to go and register for a PhD to try and claim some space for myself yes and and then also me being me I finish what I start no matter how hard it is so yeah so then I I I, I started on the journey for the PhD which was harder than I had imagined, which was, yeah. So the thing is, I am the first person at home to go to university, to graduate. And when I, when I went to university for my first degree, I didn't know that there, there's a master's and there's a PhD. Like for me, I was getting a degree and I thought you go to university, you get a degree and that's the end of it. 
Um, and then when I was at university, I then found out that um, you can get a master's and you can get a PhD. And yeah, and so I was going to get all of them. Um, well, learning is a passion of mine. I'm, I, I am always wanting to learn and I'm always, and I'm discovering every day that there's something new to learn. So yeah, so I then registered for a PhD, which was something that I had wanted to do, but I didn't know that I would do it with a three month old. Um, yeah, and, and now looking back, I realized that, um, you know, God orders our footsteps and sometimes we are not aware that that is what he's doing. So for yes. me, I was just running back to try and discover myself again after having a baby. Um, but God was ordering my footsteps. And then um, midway through the PhD, I got the baby bug again. I, I wanted to have another child. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and so I had, I had my second son. Um, at that point, I thought I'm going to be pregnant. I'm going to be, so I had done my research. Now yes. what I was left with was to write uh, my thesis. And so in my head, I thought that I have done my research. I can fall pregnant now. I'm going to be able to write while I'm pregnant. And that was such a lie that I was telling myself. It was, yeah, I, I, I struggled to then yeah. write. And so I took a year off the PhD from when I was five months pregnant uh, until I gave birth and then went, went back, re-registered when he was six months old. And, and then I realized when I went back, um, when I re-registered that I actually needed distance from, from, from the work because when I came back to write, I had so much clarity that I didn't have at the yes. point when I just finished the research. And so again, I realized there that God was so intricately involved and it, everything just worked out in such a way that I had this one year of being a mother, spending time with my eldest son and then having the second baby and then going back. Um, yeah, and, and then I, I then graduated when my youngest was, I think he was three, I've forgotten, but in 2017, yeah, so he was three um, when I was graduate, when I graduated. And so when I, when I graduated, my eldest son was like, oh, so you're a doctor now. And then we had a conversation about me being a doctor. Yes. And then he decided that he's also going to be a doctor, but a real one, not like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and tell me, at three months old, every woman is asking this question. When you're, you're, your little baby, you're holding your three month old baby and you look across to your husband and you say, sweetheart, I'm going to be doing my PhD. How did you convince him? How, how did that work? So, yeah, so I get, I get a lot of people asking me, how, how did I do it? Well, yes. they ask, the married people ask me, how did I convince my husband to do a PhD when I had a three month old? Um, single people and sometimes married people who were like colleagues who were also doing their PhDs but didn't have kids were also asking, how do I do it? How do I have yes. kids and be a wife? And so in terms of my husband, I, I really didn't have to ask for permission um, because we, we are a partnership and we are supporting each other in this life. Yes. He has dreams, I have dreams. And um, in his, in, yeah, so I, I he, he had always known that I wanted to do a PhD. Doing it when the baby was three months old was, but, but then there were also other, other reasons why I, 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 I went back to do my PhD then. I had, I had done, I had just done my master's and I felt that I, I had networks 
that were going to be useful for me doing a PhD. If mm -hmm. I, I felt like if I had taken a step back, I might, it might be another uphill kind yes. of struggle to find a network and a, a space where a community that I felt would support me in doing the PhD. So it wasn't, it wasn't only that I, yeah, I wanted to find myself. I mean, that was part of it, but the other part was also thinking strategically about, um, yeah, about my place within the university and the relationships that I had built. Yeah. And yeah, so, so then he was, he was supportive um of of that decision um yeah so that's i i suppose this is this was part of conversations that we were always having about mm -hmm. where we want to go what we want to do in life um and then yeah so and then in terms of how how to be a mother and do a phd and be a wife i basically you have to prioritize right? You, you have to choose what's important for you. So first off, I did my master's in the first year that we got married. So okay. we got married and I, I registered for a, a master's degree. And this was five years after I had been in school. And I was also shifting from um, a natural science degree to a social science degree of which the engagement is totally different. And yeah. I didn't know. And then when I, I was starting out, I didn't know what I know now. I, I didn't know how to read an academic paper, which is a whole science of its own. I, yeah. And so when in our first year of marriage, uh, my husband's friends ended up saying, are you really sure you have a wife? Because Friday night, they would be going out. And this way, some of them were couples, young couples, some of them single people. And he was always showing up on his own. And this was because I had to study. I had lots of reading. I didn't know how to read. And so reading took me a lot of time. And it was very hard, but I was committed to getting it right, as I was committed to putting in the work. Um, yeah, because I was not going to fail. So I, yeah, I, I prioritized that. I wasn't the cool wife who's out on Friday night. He was going out and coming back home to find me still studying. And I think that's, that's, that's how you get to do what you want to do. Um, you have to realize and when we started, I did say that we have seasons in life. And for me at that point, that was yeah. an opportunity that I had received. And also the thing was, I really wanted to study. I couldn't afford to pay for myself. I had received a scholarship. And so I was going to milk this opportunity as yes. much as I could. So prioritizing, it, I, it was important for me that I finished the PhD. I also wanted to be a mother. And I, 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 I am a wife. And so I prioritized relationships. I prioritized what I give my time and energy to. And so at a certain point, I, I had to make the decision, if certain relationships don't survive this, then maybe they were not worthwhile in the first place. Because if the relationship um, can survive if the person can understand that this is important, that I'm, I'm, I might not be able to attend their birthday party, or I might not be able to have a coffee with them because I am, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a PhD and I'm also a mother. And so for me, I, I prioritized my marriage and my, my children in that way. Uh, so this is how I, I was able to do it. It was difficult, but yeah. It was a season. And now I look back, I am able to be like, yeah, I did that in yeah, in nine years. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, and also much more importantly, I I had the conviction that this is where God wanted to, me to be. Yes. And and also God's grace for each season, like there's grace for each season. And for me, as I look back, I'm just like, this was grace. Because the other thing is, I really didn't think I could get a PhD in as much as I spent seven years of my life getting a PhD. Every day, 
when I sat down to write, I had a, a little journal where I had to write myself a letter. Every day I was convincing myself, Dudu, you can do this. Dudu, you can finish this PhD. Dudu, you are good enough to do this, you know? Wow. And so, yeah, and so I, it was really grace that I was able to, to have the grit to push through the doubt and everything that, you know, um, the self-talk that's like, really, you're going yeah. to do this? You, you are not going to be able to finish. And actually, um, so I think this was three days before my supervisor told me that, oh yeah, now it's, it's your thesis is complete. You can submit. I, I was sitting, so I had a, a, we turned one of the rooms into an office that I could close the door and, yes. and work in. And so, this one evening, this is like three days before my supervisor says you're done, right? I am sitting there trying to figure out my conclusion, right? I mean, I have written a whole, so my thesis is about 300 and something pages. Yes. The, the conclusion is like just, I think it's 10 pages of that. I have written all these other 300 pages and the conclusion is, yeah, I was just, I, I, I had, I didn't know how to write this conclusion. I felt like I am never going to be able to write this conclusion. And so yes. I sat there and struggled and struggled. And then I decided, I, I switched off my laptop and closed it and put it away and came out of the room crying, like tears streaming down my face. Yes. And now my husband is like, what's wrong? He's like, have you received a message that, you know, something has happened? What, what is wrong? And I'm like, I'm never going to finish. I'm so sorry. These years, I've spent all these years doing this, but I'm, I'm not finishing. This thing is hard. It is hard. I can't do it. I'm like, when I walked out of that room that day, I was done. I was like, I'm never coming back to this yeah. This this PhD, this is hard. I have given it my all, I can't do this. And so my husband being calm is like, goes back, takes me back into the room, <laughs> sits me down and then sits next to me and is like, maybe if you tell me what you want to say, it will help you to figure out what you want to write. And so, yeah, he was, I was telling my niece the other day that I think he should have been given a, Deputy PhD. <laughs> but that brings me to that brings me to another question because you know coming from a culture, coming from you you've come from Zim, coming from a system, coming from a culture where there's very sort of gender based roles, that type of thing, you've now had to to find your own rhythm in order to survive these nine years and and have such a beautiful marriage right now. Um, as well as raise two children. It's a lot of pressure. I mean, what was key to that and to, um, you know, managing all the sort of the gender roles, the traditional gender roles? How did you guys do it? And you both grew up in Zim. You said you were the first person to go to university in your family. So it's something, you know, uh, it's not usual. Let me put it that way. Um, and, and I must say it's it's one of when I when I grow up I want to have a marriage like yours so <laughs> it's beautiful thank it's you <laughs> like I always say it's grace 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 right yeah. I, I mean I'm 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 so I'm absolutely thankful to God um, because yeah he has it's I'm really blessed to have the life that I have and I can't I can't take credit for all of it right I think. I, be, I, I really believe God's grace has been the fundamental game changer for me. Um, and then talking about coming, being, having grown up in Zim, you know, like when being in South Africa, there are moments when you know, sometimes I just wish I was, I was at home. I was in a country that I can also just say home, you know, um, where it's, it's, yeah, there aren't any, I mean, you know, the, 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 the challenges with xenophobia here and yeah. all of that. But I realized as I was reflecting um, that 
for everything that I can complain about, when I turn it around, there's, there's a very big positive to everything. So in as much as it's been difficult to be a Zimbabwean in South Africa, I've had the blessing that I could script my life and um, leave um, certain cultural practices that one are not biblical um, and, and, and are really ideas that we keep on replicating as if it's natural and it's nature, right? So when, we, when I got married, we were already both living here in South Africa. And that distance from home, that distance from, from the culture that brought us and a culture that we had internalized Right. So in as much as we talk about shifting, shifting gender dynamics and shifting gender roles, a big part of it I found in my experience was inside of me more than what anyone said. Right. Yeah. I was in South Africa, but I still would be the first one to jump up if the house is dirty. You know, like, oh, the house is dirty. If someone comes here, what are they going to think of me? I have internalized my value to be represented by what I'm able to accomplish in, in terms of cleaning the house. Yeah. Um, if, yeah, so th those kinds of values that we grow up with that are not necessarily good, right? And that, um, for example, the, the fact that we expect um, the girl child to know how to cook, to know how to take care of children, and we don't expect that of, of the boy child. And in as much as I grew up, I, 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 I didn't grow up with a lot of that because my parents had girls. So I remember my husband being shocked that we were changing the light bulb because it's like he didn't think girls could do such a thing. So one of the, the, the things that allowed us to have the life that we have was that we were not in Zimbabwe. And so we were able, distance gives perspective and allows you to see certain things that you would think are natural, you know? Like you think it's natural for the, for the woman to, to, to nurture children more than a man. And yet that's something that we, we can all grow and develop in, right? And, and also doing the PhD is one of the things that allowed me to see the ways that I was continuing to sustain the unequal gender dynamics within our home. Like I've talked about that, I would be the first one to jump up and clean the house. Um, there came a time when, so first um, at the beginning of 2016, um, I was talking about what it would take to finish. And so my husband was like, okay, what do we need to do for you to finish? And that was, I don't actually remember what we talked about, but I do remember him asking that question, like, what do we need to do for you to finish? And so that shifted um, the amount of how much I was taking on in, term, in terms of the kids, right? Yeah. Like uh, packing school lunches, dropping them off at school, picking them up, it shifted in that. But also at that point, because I wanted to finish now, the PhD became priority. If the dishes had not been washed, I was also passing the sink and going into my office, locking the door and sitting down to write. And then someone else has to take up the dishes and wash them. Yes. Because, and what I, I realized was that in as much as my husband wanted to take on those roles, we have both been brought up in a way that it will take him longer to think about doing it. And for me, it will be, you know, I will quickly jump up yeah. and do it. And so in as much as you might have, we had the right, we both had the right intention. We were agreed on that intention, but our, what we had been, in, what we had internalized in how we had been brought up was standing in the way. And the yes. pressure of needing to finish the PhD was like the created the slope for us to 
swim down and get to that place where we now, um, in like right now, we'll be like, oh, what are we eating today? And I'm also like, oh yeah, what are we eating today, right? It's no longer because I am the mother, I am responsible for running the house. Yeah, so it's been, so a lot of the times, yeah, like especially if I bump onto a tweet about Zimbabweans needing to go back to Zimbabwe and that sort of thing, I, it triggers feelings of like, oh, I wish I was home, I wish, you know, but I've also really been blessed by being far from, because I think it was also going to be difficult. Because I know when, when my mother comes to visit, she's always like, you, this man, he's always this busy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you have a very interesting point. You know, we speak about xenophobia, we speak about. Um, having foreign foreign nationals coming into South Africa, and yet you've brought so much of value into this country, and not just this country, but globally. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you brought into the country and what you've done to build this nation. Um. <laughs> so let's talk about the work, maybe. My work. Um. So I, 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 I work um, in research and, and probably this is why I, I am very sensitive to issues around xenophobia because I study migration and I find that um, people's, the way we think about people that like myself who are migrants or refugees, asylum seekers, people who come to South Africa, we tend to forget their humanity. Their stories become numbers, right? We, we are thinking of all these people that are coming in and we, we lose the faces, we lose their stories. Um, and so for me in my work, one of the challenges that I find is that we are doing a lot of, of research but perhaps it's not reaching um, the public. And so I am very passionate about translating the work that's done in research into forms that everybody can, can engage with the data and know what's happening. And, and so for example, research tends to be taken as the hard truth. And I think this season in 2020 has has shown us how, how research is always a tentative truth. We started off, um, ma we shouldn't be wearing masks, right? Do you remember when, when, yes. when, when, yes. when, um, when uh, the COVID <laughs> pandemic yeah, yes. first started? Um, people were being advised not to wear masks and that sort of thing. But that was, that was based on the knowledge that we had then. And um, as, as we developed, as research developed more knowledge, we realized actually people need to wear masks and then people need to wear masks. And I've seen a lot of people um, saying, but, but first off you said we mustn't wear masks and now we, we are wearing masks. And the, the, the important thing is to realize that we, we are always getting more knowledge and getting to know better. And as soon as we know better, we change. And I think that's an important, um, that's an important trait to have, to always be wanting to learn and wanting to change. And, and I think the world in general is becoming more and more global. We have to, to more and more uh, be open to people that were not born here. And, the other thing I think that's important to realize is that xenophobia is not a South African thing. Yes. Um, we've seen a lot of xenophobia across the globe. We've seen what's happening in the United States. We've seen with, um, within Europe as well, right? And, and so without exceptionalizing South Africa, we need to realize that more and more with technology, it's becoming easier for people to move across the world. And we need to 
to be open to people who are different from us, um, to be open to, yeah, to, to, to realizing that things change and there's, there's value in the people that come to our country. Yeah. Yeah. But also there are, there are South Africans that are also going to different places across the world, right? Yeah. So, I mean, talking about a global platform and a global space, um, you, you work all over the world. I mean, you know, sometimes I have to check, um, can we have dinner? And, uh, no, I'm in the UK. For how long? Uh, for six months or for, for 18 months. How on earth do you, do you I mean, and I know Butu and the children are often flying over to be with you and you've spent extensive amount of times there. How on earth do you manage um, such a global footprint? Um, and how do you embrace that as a woman of Africa? So I, I actually have been reflecting on, on, on my life and realized that I actually, from the time when I was a child, I have not lived in one place. Yes. So my parents, then I was in Zimbabwe, my parents were working out of town in a small town just next to our hometown. And for a short while I lived, so we would be at the school where my parents were teachers. I would be at the school where my parents were teaching. And on the weekend we would go home. Um, later on, I lived with my sister. I would be at my sister's house during the week and on the weekends go to my parents' house because they are back from work and they're at home. Yes, yes. When I started working, I worked for a development um, agency, a, an NGO, and I worked in the rural areas. I was, um, I was at, in the rural areas during the week and coming home over the weekend. Yes. And, and then now it's, it's been, it's turned to be, I am crossing borders to the UK, or wherever, um, and 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 I, I suppose because my life has always been on the move like that, for me it's not. I I yeah I, it's not it's not. But how do you how do you balance how do you balance the children? Um, so balance the children. What do you mean? I I I am a, I am children a, having to to move them across from the UK to South Africa. You know. So I, I have been incredibly blessed in that my husband is able, because he works for himself, he's able yeah. to um, at times travel with me. And so we can travel with the kids because then he is there with the kids while I work. It would be difficult for me to be there with the kids and no one to, to look after them. Um, and, and also I, I believe the earth, is the, the earth is the Lord's, right? And I, I, I really want to go everywhere in the world where it's possible to go. I, yeah. And I, I suppose again, priorities. I, I, I will put my money into traveling rather than anything else. Of course, I've also been incredibly blessed in that because I'll be traveling for work, then I, my own expenses, I only have to cover my family's expenses and yes. not on. So it's been useful in that way. Um, but yeah, for, for a lot of academics, travel is like the, you, you, you get to travel for conferences, um, travel is in exchange to go and teach in other universities. I've been incredibly blessed to be able to teach. Um, I've taught in Sweden, I've taught in Germany. I have, yeah, I've taught in the UK as well. So I, I absolutely am amazed at the life that, when I say that with my parents, I used to be traveling every week from one place to the other. Yeah. I was getting, my, my parents didn't own a car. We were getting into public transport. We were getting yeah. onto a train. And so it's amazing what God can do. I mean, I am absolutely shocked. At, at how God has been graceful and has blessed me so amazingly that I, yeah, that I get, I am able to do these things. Yes. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So our vision for Rebel, I know it's something that sits quite close to your heart. Um, you know, the, the recyclable sanitary towels or the, you know, not the disposable ones, but the cloth ones. Um, will it ever incept with your vision and your dreams? How does it, how does it link to, your, to what you believe in? So I, I was that girl at some point who, who couldn't afford sanitary way. And I mean, growing up in Zimbabwe, there was a point where it was absolutely, ex even at this point in Zimbabwe, yes. it's really expensive to, to be able to buy sanitary wear. And, and I, I believe, so one of the things that I believe is that who am I, me being a woman shouldn't be what stops me from living life to the fullest. Yes. Right? Which is, yeah, which is also why I suppose I registered for a PhD when my baby was three months old, because so many men have will have babies during their PhDs. It's nothing big. But for me, it was such a big thing. Why? Because the world has not created the structures to support me to achieve whatever dream I want. Right? Yes. Instead, there are all these hurdles that one has to one has to jump over. If you if you're a girl, you you might not be able to go to to school because um, you have your period. Um, yes. So for me, it's really close to my heart because I want the only impediment to me achieving my goals to be me. Let it be nothing else, right? If I'm a girl. Let, let nothing else stop me from living the life I want to live except me. Let it not be that because I am a girl, then I am not able to, to go to school because today I, I got my period. Yeah. Um, we have so many technological advancements that really biology is not, is not what should be stopping us from pursuing our dreams. And, and so, the world has to shift and become yeah. friendly and so that women think of themselves as humans right if i'm a i'm a human i'm i'm able to do whatever every other human is able to do yes. and my biology shouldn't stand in the way of that so i'm i'm really excited about rebel um and excited about what you're doing so you said you. At, the, at the beginning yes. that you're doing this in the month of August because it's Women's Month? Because it's Women's Month, but it's something that will stay on our radar. It's not something that will ever go off my radar. Um, and I mean, I so identify with you when you said, you know, you were one of those girls and it, it's difficult. It's difficult for me personally, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, if, um, if a woman is having to make a choice between buying sanitary pads and or sanitary wear, and a loaf of bread or a packet of uh, milli meal, I feel that that is a violent choice. And it shouldn't be um, even tolerated in this day and age. I mean, we've come so far as, an, uh, you know, as, a, as the world, we've come so far in, in terms of technology. Look at the way we are chatting now. It's incredible. Yeah. And we haven't addressed this basic need of the woman. And so these, these sanitary towels were featured in Vogue. It's not a poor girl's pad. They, they're quite unique. They actually cost like under 34 US cents per month because they last up to five years. And so it is my desire and my dream to get this into girls' hands so that, yeah, it, it is not an impediment for any woman to, to uh, you know, uh, achieve her goals or doesn't put her on the back foot in terms yeah. of going to school because 75% of absenteeism is due to a girl not being able to attend school. And that in itself is heartbreaking to think about. It is. Yeah. yeah. It is, absolutely. I think it's it's a really important initiative. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really excited at seeing it yeah. uh, reach every girl, you know. Uh, I, I, I've already said that I'm going to support. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and I hope people that uh, are watching will also um, support getting rebel into girls and women's hands who need it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for your support. It means, it really means a lot. Um, I know it's your birthday month and instead of a present, you're, <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing this. So, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you as we're, we're coming up to a close, what is your message of hope? And not just for women, but for, for, for people. What is your message of hope? What is your seed of hope that you'd like to plant today? Um, I, we are living in such a noisy world. Yes. And we have technology, which is good. I mean, technology has allowed us to do this. And um, there are so many good things out of technology. But I think one of one of the gifts that 2020 has in a, in and like i said for every challenge when we turn it around and look at look at it on the other end there's a positive and yeah. i think one of the positives out of 2020 is the time it has given us time to be still and quiet and i think there's such a value in just sitting and being still there's a, a documentary on YouTube that um, people can go and find. It's called The Big Silence. And this is a monk that invited people to, um, to silence. And yes. really amazing how people found God in the silence. You know, we spend our lives running. And I'm one of those that has spent her life running and sometimes it's running from my own self because I don't want to be quiet and really be there with myself. But I, I really would like to challenge everyone to embrace the silence that 2020 has, has given us and allow ourselves to really reflect and find the things that we are grateful for and find the things that we want to to remove from our lives. You know, there's, um, we always talk about dancing in the rain as this amazing romantic thing, right? Um, but the other day I was sitting and thinking, eh, dancing in the rain, you probably end up with mud on your feet, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and, then, and then I realized something, for you to dance in the rain and enjoy it, you have to forget about the mud. You have to be in the moment. Yeah. And then later on, you can think about the mud, but the moment of dancing in the rain stays with you forever. Yeah. And, and what happens in the noise that we allow ourselves to be in is we are dancing in the rain and thinking about the mud and we lose that special moment. And dancing in the rain is not like a two hour dance, right? It's a five minute, you yes. have to immerse yourself in the rain, in the moment and soak it in and that moment lives with you forever. And so silencing ourselves and being in the moment, taking in that moment of dancing in the rain, we'll think about the mud later, but there's such value in being yeah, silent. About living in the moment yeah yeah that's beautiful thank you and so uh dr dudu <laughs> what advice would you have for young girls um especially or and young boys wanting to follow the stream wanting to you know travel work globally um what what advice would you give up give them um so i would say it's very important to have a dream yeah. have a dream have a dream when i look back over my life right now sometimes i was not running after the dream but the dream was following me because uh -huh. there was so i my dream and and sometimes your it will seem like your dream has died or you've lost the dream i i i, I wanted to be a medical doctor i wanted to be a pediatrician but i my my high school grades were not good enough for me to to go into medicine. And at that point, I didn't want to do anything because I haven't, I didn't get my first choice. So mm. nothing else matters. And I'm so grateful that my father, actually my father forced me to go to university in Ishani. I didn't want, because I didn't get my first choice, I was not going to university, yeah. which is why I'm saying have a dream. And sometimes your dream will look like it has died 
but it hasn't. And sometimes it's, it's life refining the dream. Because yes. right now, when I think of myself and think I, I, I would have made a terrible medical doctor, I think, you know? And, and so I, it's important to have a dream. And, and when you have a dream to keep on trusting and, be, and whatever you find your hand to do, do it with everything that you have because mm -hmm. you don't know what pathway opens the door for you. And life is not a straight, it's not like you go from A to B. I know I was also young and I thought you just go from A to B. I had a plan and my plan was totally jumbled up, but today I'm, I'm grateful to be where I am. So I have a dream, trust God, you know, trust that God has got you. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know how else I could do life without trusting God, because there's so much that I don't know. There's so much that I can't control. There's, yeah, there's a lot that's happening in life. And there's a certain place where you just need to be like, I'm handing this over to you. And I don't know how it turns out. And then there yeah. are things that happen that are painful and it's only God who can, who's able to, to help you cope with those things. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps before saying have a dream, I'd say have God, have a relationship with God know God for yourself, not what someone else tells you, you know, have a, a deep conviction about where you know that you know that you know. Like I yeah. said, I put my head down, it was hard to do the PhD, but because I knew that I knew that I knew, I was able to pull through, even though I, I didn't think I could get a PhD, I was like, okay, God, this is hard, I don't think I can do it, but you're saying I should be here. And and, and, and when you have God, there are storms, there's all sorts of things, but God always comes through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How beautiful is that? And so it's the first thing, the fundamental thing is to have a relationship with God in a space of knowing that you know that you know. That's very powerful. And also that, you know, the, the word says, without vision, my people perish. And so, but, but there were, must have been something. So you didn't get your dream to be a medical doctor and you had to readjust and your dad almost forced it or, or challenge, challenge, challenged uh, you to go to university. Um, so what was that moment where, oh, okay, I didn't get my dream. Like, how do I, how do I readjust and move quickly? I mean, you were 17, 18, how did you know? There was no readjustment. Like, it's not like my father. My father forced me, Nishan. Like, I needed a parent. And that's the other thing for young people. It's, for me, as an 18 year old, I was now like, eh, I didn't get my first, I don't, I don't really know. I didn't want to do anything because I yes. didn't, get, you know, my heart was sore. And so I didn't want yes. to do anything else. So I was literally forced to go and apply. So that's and, just bothering. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was just parenting. Like, you're going to do this. You're not going to sit here at my house and do nothing. You are going to go to university. And, and that's just what I, and then when I got into university, I had to pass because, yeah. So I had to do, and then I, I, I realized, um, and then somehow I then realized uh, actually what I like is working with people. Yeah. So I had an idea that I want to be a doctor because I want to help people. And then I got, my, my dream got tied to being a doctor. And yet the thing that I really was passionate about was working with people. So when I was now in, so my actually the first degree that I had been offered was biochemistry. And I remember in, I was, and I did that for a week and I, re, and I imagined myself in a lab with looking at stuff. I was like, no, I like working with people. And yeah. so, I, and then I, so then I, I shifted and went into environmental science and health because there, there was an opportunity to work with communities. So sometimes you need to, you, you are young and you think you know, but you don't and life unfolds. And so it's important, I guess the important thing, it's important to have people that are speaking into your life. Actually, if yeah. you are young, your parents, listen to your parents. God gave you those parents for a reason. They might mess up 
and, and in many other ways, but I'm so grateful that my father was that teacher who was like, you are going to apply to university, you know? <laughs> Because, yeah, because I don't know where I would have been if I hadn't started uh, being forced. Yeah. I mean, I was forced, Nishani, because the first day when they gave me money to go and apply, I took a taxi to town. I hung around for a few hours, went back home and said I didn't know how to get to the university. And the following morning, he gave me money again and he said, there was a guy at church who was at the university. He's like, go and look for that guy, tell him to show you how to get there. But I knew how to get there. So I just went and I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, and um, okay, so any advice? Thank you, thank you for that. Any advice for us to succeed in a nutshell as we are starting this journey? Um, consistency is key. Keep doing what you're doing and um, you, like cons what consistency does is that you never know what is going to lead to what, right? Yeah. And so when you are faithful, if you have found this is what I want to do, this is what I'm, I'm feeling called to do, be, be faithful with that. You don't need to know everything else. When you are faithful with where you are right now, God takes care of the rest. And so, yeah. I would say, just be consistent. Just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep being brilliant like you're being. And <laughs> God takes care of the rest. Yeah, yeah. I believe so too. I do believe if we, if we come with, to God with an open hand and give him what we've got and what we can, then uh, he does take care of the rest. Is there anything else you'd like to add as we come to a close? Um, I just would like to say thank you. Thank you. This has been, yeah, it has taken me down memory lane, remembering that I didn't want to go to university. I was very <laughs> wise at 18, you know? <laughs> and um, yeah, 2020 has been a difficult year in so many ways, but it's also come with gifts. And I think we all need to be asking ourselves, what is the gift that 2020 has brought to me? Yeah. So that we don't miss that moment of dancing in the rain in 2020. That's beautiful. What is the gift that 2020 has brought us? And as we conclude, I also just want to say, if you want to get involved, if you want to partner with us, if you want to make a difference, um, please just inbox me or go to our page, Succeed, S-U-C-S-E-E-D on Facebook. And you can like our page and contact us there. The information is available on, on the Succeed page. And I also want to say a very big thank you to you, Dr. Dido, for your time, for your expertise, for, for agreeing to come on board. I know it's um, and, and a lovely belated birthday wish as well. So this is your birthday month. It's wonderful to have you with us. Um, your insight has been wonderful. It's been encouraging. And it just makes you realize, hey, you know, I always look at you and I think, gosh, she's in her 30s and she's a doctor and she's got a PhD. And, you know, it's, it's attainable. It is attainable and it is achievable. So congratulations and well done. We wish you well. Um, and on behalf of myself and uh, Richard Maestri, Patrick, we just want to say a very big thank you to all of you who've tuned in, who are listening and who've always, um, always supporting us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it is because, it is because of Ubuntu, it is, be, we are because of you. So thank you, as, we, as I close now, I just wanna say, may God bless you, may God make his face to shine upon you, and may you know hope in every day of 2020. Thank you and God bless. Bye-bye, Dudu. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>